okay. Augustian is just joining in. Hi, Andrea. You just have to write your country name in front of your name. I will certainly. Lovely to see everybody. Yeah. yeah. So please write Ireland in front of your name. I will do. Hi, Nam. Nam, you also put your country in front of your name. Hi, Ken. Everyone's waiting for you. <laughs> and they all want to say hi to you in their own languages. <laughs> so please, one by one, alphabetically, if possible, let's go. Alberto, Alexander, after that. Alberto, you want to say hi to Ken? Okay, Alberto doesn't want to say hi. Yeah, hello, Vikram. This is Gunasilan. Hello, Ken. Looking yes. forward to this meeting. Okay. I thought, I thought it would be a good idea if everyone said it in their languages, I think, but they just right now don't want to say anything. So Okay. Fine. <laughs> so, Ken, whenever you want to start, whenever you want to start. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we begin, Vikram? I wanted everyone to say hi to you. That was for the idea. They were all from all over the world. I said in their languages, if they said it, but I think everyone feels when they're in a webinar, they should just mute yourself, mute themselves and sit there. But I didn't want them to be mute. I wanted them to be speaking participants, but I think that part of it become a logistical issue. <laughs> so please, okay, can, uh, you can start. But before you start, let me just give you a given idea of what the concept behind the symposium was that mediation is no rocket science or no alien thing to us. It's been part of our culture for centuries. It's just that the word itself has been spread. Maybe it's become too technical for people. They think that's away from what they already do. So they already do that. The idea here is to bring that out so that if you're developing a culture of mediation in the world, people should know they're familiar with the process. They just have to adopt it and then develop a culture of mediation. But the other important thing that we'll be doing here is trying to differentiate the fact that in our culture, there's arbitration and there's been mediation. To be able to differentiate the two so that the word, the word that goes out from a certain culture, like in India, everyone says panchayat. Everyone, panchayat is used a lot. In, that Mediation is panchayat. But actually, panchayat used to give a decision. So if I tell a person in a village that mediation is what the panchayat does, they'll think that they're doing arbitration. So that will go into their mind. So there'll be nothing different. So now in Kazakhstan, Alexander is from Kazakhstan. We were having a conversation on this aspect. So I said, we were just did a quick Google search. And it said in Kazakhstan, there's something called BIYS, bees. So I asked him, it says mediation has been there. He said, that is like a Sharia court. So the, the, I mean, if a large institution in the US puts on their website that in Kazakhstan, bees is mediation, and actually it's a Sharia court, then if I tell someone in Kazakhstan that, this is bees as mediation is that he won't understand the inside is just someone giving an order so that differentiation also we'll try and bring out as we go along because I, i've tried to the structure it why i'm telling you this introduction is because definitely that people will listen to it if you can cloak is on a show people will listen to me also otherwise they don't listen to me so the whole idea the way i'm going about it is one developing a culture of mediation so we try and bring out this whole concept around the world that is part of your culture, please practice it. The other thing is that why the evolution of mediator, why did you come in on the first show is because the fact that a mediator, maybe there's a seed there in a person and that grows as it goes along. You don't make a mediator. A mediator is a whole collection of his own self, his spirituality, his circumstances, his experiences, all that. So that's being brought out by evolution of a mediator. In conversation with the beautiful mind is conversations with mediators from all over the world. People with the mediator mindset. It's not that you have to have a stamp of mediator, no training required, nothing. The fact is you have a mediator mindset because according to me, mediators are special people. So people should know them. They should actually know who mediators are and put a face to it. So that is the idea behind that. And of course, the symposium. And we'll do a lot of other things as we go along. And the other appeal that I put out is that please support me, send a gift because a lot of time is spent in all this and I have to answer my wife and daughter when they say, why don't you do some work? And for them, promotion of mediation is not work. So I have said what I had to, I've done my promotion, everything. Now, Ken, is your show. Thank you very much, Vikram. 
first, thank you for inviting me to come and speak with you. And um, thanks to each of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to uh, stop for a moment and think together about our work and uh, the ways in which culture impacts us. So uh, in the beginning, when we first think of culture, when we heard, first hear the word culture, most of us tend to think about art, uh, about music, about dance, about literature and poetry. Uh, and then the question becomes, what is it that these things contribute to our being? Uh, what is it that culture actually does? Uh, and we can begin really with a wonderful statement from Ortega y Gasset, who said that uh, the very first uh, uh, act of a culture is the choice of a point of view. And uh, we are going to now uh, choose a point of view, uh, which is the point of view of conflict resolution in connection with culture. Uh, and here, I think there are several uh, things that we want to uh, identify. Uh, and particularly with regard to culture, what we want to identify is the fact that culture is the principal means of uh, social learning. Uh, it is cumulative, that is, our culture has been passed down to us, um, uh, received as a gift that was struggled for by our parents. Um, and uh, in turn by their parents um, and so on throughout history. So what we now have in culture, whether it is in art or music or dance or literature or conflict resolution, um, is the sum of the, all the experiences in the Panjayat system that um, Vikram was mentioning just a moment before, plus the experiences of um, uh, tribal communities around the world with conflict. Um, so initially we need to have a better sense of what culture is. And the first thing for us to recognize is that uh, culture is uh, a way of making sure that we don't have to invent everything in our lives for ourselves. That is, it is received wisdom. Um, the uh, Nigerian novelist, uh, Wale Salinka, um, wrote a novel called The Anthills of the Savannah. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, and he wrote, um, and this is more or less a quote, if it were not for the story, our children would be falling into ditches and bumping into cactus plants. So the role of culture is to warn us about the things that are difficult, that are dangerous, um, that can get us into trouble. Culture is a map for how to um, uh, transverse a territory. And we're going to come back to the idea of culture as mapping as a technique that can be used in mediation uh, to identify uh, 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 how to get from impasse to resolution and transformation. So if culture is a form of received wisdom, if it is a way of, pr of protecting us from danger uh, and helping us um, uh, figure out how to live our lives more easily and better. And it makes sense for every culture to have something to say about conflict. So uh, indeed, if we look at any culture around the world, we can discover that there are a variety of lessons that are being taught about conflict. Uh, and conflict is a kind of central piece uh, in many cultures. But I'd like to go deeper uh, than this uh, in two different directions. Um, the first is to take a look a little bit more closely at what exactly a culture is. Uh, and from that perspective, I think that we can 
begin to understand something of what it is that is happening in mediation deep beneath the surface. So in the first place, uh, we can say that culture is communicated largely through signs and symbols. Um, and this is one of the reasons why art and music and dance and literature have such an impact on us. Um, there is meaning in those signs and symbols. And what the culture consists of um, is a way of attributing meaning uh, to things that otherwise may have no meaning. Language is an example of this. Um, my uh, speech, uh, my speaking to you right now uh, is just a series of sounds that you are attributing meaning to. Um, and in conflict, everyone is attributing meaning to the things that other people say and do. And if that is the case, then the first thing that we can understand is uh, every conflict has a cultural component. Or if I can put it slightly differently, every conflict is cross-cultural. And the reason it is, is because everybody attributes uh, different sets of meanings to the same things. In a marriage, um, what does it mean um, when um, somebody um, does the dishes or doesn't do the dishes or picks up uh, their clothing from the floor or doesn't pick up their clothing from the floor or whatever it may happen to be. Virtually everything that happens uh, is something that meaning is attributed to. Um, and if that is the case, then what we have to conclude is that it is necessary for mediators to have some appreciation of culture as a form of attribution of meaning. Um, how exactly do we do this? Well, um, uh, Freud once described psychoanalysis as the talking cure. Um, and we can describe mediation as the listening cure. Um, we listen to what people tell us and we discover the meaning of what they are saying from the way that they uh, respond emotionally uh, to whatever it is that has happened. Um, and then we read backwards into what has happened, the emotional information that we have gathered from looking at someone and seeing how they're responding, uh, listening to them um, uh, get upset, how they get upset, what they get upset about. So every culture has information in it about what people get upset about and how they get upset and what they do when they are upset and what they don't do uh, and what doesn't upset them. Um, and some of these are kind of generic and human. Um, and some of them are specific. Uh, some of them are detailed. Some of them are particular uh, to individual societies. But instead of thinking of culture as this large, gigantic thing, so there is a culture in Russia, and there is a culture in Poland, and there is a culture in Lithuania. There is a culture in North China and South China and East China and West China, uh, et cetera. Instead of thinking of it on those large scale terms, what about the culture of women versus the culture of men? What about the culture of children as opposed to the culture of adults? What about the culture of people who live in the country as opposed to the culture of those who live in the cities. And now let's get a little bit more detailed. What about the culture of the firstborn as opposed to the culture of the lastborn or the middle child? Um, and what about the culture uh, of someone who um, uh, uh, doesn't worry at all about being on time 
as opposed to the culture of someone who is always worried about being late. Um, to begin the session, um, Vikram sent out an email saying that he and I are generally on time. Um, well, that's an announce, that's a cultural announcement. Uh, and the goal of that announcement is to prevent conflict from happening uh, by clarifying the meaning of the time that has been set for this webinar. Um, so now we can see that between any two individuals, there are cultural um, exchanges that are taking place constantly between them. And we are each of us trying to read the other one's culture all the time. So how exactly do we do this? Well, it turns out that there is a science of doing this. It's not a very exact science. It's the science of semiotics, the science of reading signs and symbols. Uh, and um, there are a number of people who are semioticians um, who uh, write very interestingly and beautifully about this topic. Um, uh, Umberto Eco uh, is an example of a really brilliant semiotician. Um, there are many, many others ranging from William James in the United States through Saussure, uh, uh, through um, uh, Borges, uh, through um, uh, a, a, a variety of artists, a, a variety of different really brilliant writers uh, who look at signs and symbols and take them apart. What we do in mediation is we also deal with signs and symbols and we also take them apart. One of the techniques that we have for taking them apart, uh, even though our techniques are uh, not as, exp uh, as uh, expansive, I think, um, uh, as some of the ones that, I've, uh, that have been written about by the authors I just mentioned. But one of the techniques that we use uh, is called the interest-based approach. And that is, we ask the question, um, why is that important to you? What does that mean to you? Uh, and now notice um, that we can even begin the entire mediation process and organize it around a series of cultural exchanges, uh, exchanges that are designed to uh, clarify what the meaning is of any particular issue for any particular person. So um, if we then think about what is culture, we can see that it is fundamentally a way of approaching our environment. Um, but we can also think of it as uh, how we group and separate from each other, how we link up uh, and how we divide. Uh, how food is produced and how gender is perceived and displayed, um, how space uh, and boundaries uh, and time uh, are, uh, are clarified, established, created, how communication happens, how learning takes place, um, even if you will, how people laugh and play. Um, we can also think of it as uh, a way of processing perceiving and processing reality. So uh, what culture does is it tells us what is happening and it tells us how to behave. So um, one very easy, simple definition of culture uh, is what everybody knows and nobody talks about. So um, nobody spoke beforehand about what to wear on this Zoom call. And yet we all chose clothes to wear um, that we thought would be appropriate somehow. What defined what is appropriate? Um, well, the answer is partly experience, partly watching other people and learning from them. Uh, and this is largely how um, uh, uh, culture gets communicated. Um, if you watch uh, certain animals, uh, corvids, for example, certain kinds of birds, um, uh, they will 
teach each other how to use tools, how to create tools. Uh, chimpanzees do this quite frequently. Uh, and nobody says anything to anyone. Uh, it's just that what happens is they watch uh, and learn from each other. And we are doing this all the time. Um, and uh, in addition, we can say that um, uh, there are uh, a series of different uh, ideas about culture that come out of cultural anthropology. And the man who I particularly appreciate is uh, Edward T. Hall, who is a, uh, a North American uh, cultural anthropologist who wrote a book called The Silent Language and a number of other books. Particularly, he studied the uh, Hopi and Navajo and Zuni uh, communities in the US. Uh, and he described various ways of uh, appreciating culture. Uh, and what he identified was um, some examples of cultural differences that we can see, uh, every one of them uh, can lead to conflict. Uh, precision versus ambiguity in communication. How precise versus how ambiguous are you? Uh, open versus closed in personal information. How much do you share about what has happened to you? Uh, verbal versus written as a basis for tradition. Um, and the, probably the principal one that he identified is what is called what he called high and low context in establishing meaning. So the question is, how much context do you require in order to determine what the meaning of anything is? Uh, and uh, we can think of certain cultures, for example, scientific cultures, engineering, uh, or even law as a culture requires very little context to understand what something means because the definition is given to you. Um, if you want to understand what larceny is, um, you can go to um, any statute and you will discover that it is the trespassery taking and carrying away of the personal property of another, whatever the definition is. Um, and you don't need much context in order to understand what that is. The emotional communication, on the other hand, requires a great deal of context. Um, uh, romantic communication, sexual communication require enormous amounts of context in order to understand the meaning of anything. So for example, I can say hello in a way that is angry or sad or jealous, um, or um, uh, fearful um, or um, highly sexually charged, uh, I can have um, hundreds of meanings that are associated just with the way that I say the word hello. So how do we know what it means? And the answer is, there is no absolute clear, um, uh, if you will, scientific meaning of the word hello. It is established through our experiences, uh, through our relationships with each other, through our expectations of those relationships and whether those expectations are being met or not, um, through our assumptions about what the other person knows or doesn't know. Well, why did she say hello to me that way? Doesn't she know that I'm suffering? How could she possibly say hello to me in that way, right? Whatever it may happen to be, whenever there is an emotional component, you require enormous amounts of context in order to understand something this. And isn't this exactly the case with conflict? Don't we require a tremendous amount of context in order to understand what something means? Now, here's a new definition of mediation. It is a method for establishing the context and therefore the meaning of any communication or experience. Now, here's what this means. Um, I, I mentioned the first thing I think that it means. The first thing that it means is every mediation is a cross-cultural 
experience. Every conflict is a cross-cultural conflict. But here's the second thing that it means. Every resolution is necessarily an act of culture. That is, every resolution is achieved through some kind of cultural means. Now, this is a very different approach to mediation than the one that we, most of us, have been taught. Um, when I learned mediation um, about uh, 41 years ago, um, uh, nobody mentioned culture at all. Uh, today, I think we might very well have mentions uh, of culture, but most of the mentioning of culture is to say, here's what you don't do if you are mediating in Pakistan. Uh, or here's what you need to watch out for if you're mediating between Koreans um, and Japanese, uh, or between African Americans and Latinos in the United States. Here are some cultural um, taboos, if you will. Um, and taboos are one of the things that cultural anthropologists have understood about uh, culture, uh, norms, taboos, a whole series of different ideas about how cultures organize themselves. But um, the problem is that what is taboo to one person is not necessarily taboo to another. Uh, somebody who is a hero in one culture may be a villain in another. Um, the very same act that seems to you uh, perfectly fine and acceptable and respectful, um, no problem with it whatsoever. Um, it means something completely different to someone else. Um, those of you in other countries around the world may or may not be aware of the fact that uh, the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, um, is now being called upon by the president of the United States to resign for having engaged in sexual harassment with a series of women. And he made a statement the other day saying, this is not who I am, this is not what I do. But meanwhile, what we see is, and he actually Italian, he comes from an Italian uh, family that is very physical. Um, and that physicality could be misinterpreted by somebody else. This is not to say that this is uh, exactly what happened with them, but to say that there is a cultural component uh, in our understanding of what these events actually mean to different people. How do we figure out what they actually mean? We create dialogues. And therefore, what we want to do as mediators is to create culturally informed dialogues. And in order to do that, we have to create a new category of intelligence. We have emotional intelligence. We need cultural intelligence. That is uh, the ability to develop a set of skills in appreciating culture um, and working with it that can help us unlock conflicts in their cultural location. Now, let me take a step back and then a couple of steps forward. The step back is this. Where are conflicts located? And I believe that they are located primarily in three places. One, internally inside of us. Two, relationally between us. And three, environmentally um, around us. And that means culturally around us as well. So how exactly um, do we appreciate this? Well, in the first place, we can see that each of these locations impacts the other. Um, and uh, we are impacted in personally, individually by our environment. We are impacted by our relationships with others. Who we are personally impacts our relationships um, and impacts our environment, etc. So these interact with each other. And um, if we are going to resolve a conflict completely, we need to resolve it in all three locations. Internally, inside of us, 
relationally between us and environmentally, or if you will, systemically around us. And that includes culturally as well. So how do we do this? Um, I think that we begin with ourselves. So here is uh, the very first question. And those of you who are practicing mediators probably have already had experience with this. What is the expectation of the people who are experiencing conflict who come to see you about what your role is? And uh, here I'll just tell a story and then we will you know, kind of return to this topic. Um, the story involves a wonderful uh, uh, North American mediator. His name is John Paul Lederach, who was doing a training. He's very, he's fluent in Spanish. He was doing a training in Mexico. Um, uh, and the training consisted entirely of people from Mexico. The issue came from Mexico. The conversation was entirely in Spanish. And when he debriefed it afterwards and asked people what it what, what they saw, one person raised his hand and said, you all sound like meaning North Americans, Yankees, people from the US, non-Mexican. And he couldn't figure out why this was. And the reason was because it wasn't the conflict or the people, it was the culture of mediation that had not um, uh, uh, seemed to people to grow organically out of their experience. It seemed to be an imposition brought in from outside. So how do we deal with this? Let's go back to the idea about the panchaya. What are the expectations of people in India or Pakistan who are using the panchayat system as a form of dispute resolution? What are their expectations of the people who are conducting uh, that panchayat. And the um, uh, answers are, of course, going to be all over the map. But here's what we can do in mediation. We can, say, we can ask with a, ver a very simple question to begin with. What role would you like me to play in this conversation? And what you will get is a culturally informed answer. So, um, the, um, that's a form of cultural intelligence, meaning an awareness of the presence of culture and a skill or technique that will allow us to surface that culture. Uh, here's what Lederach did. Uh, he developed a process that is called the elicitive approach uh, in which you elicit from within a culture what it is um, that actually happens. Uh, many years ago, uh, I was doing a training in Nicaragua for the uh, Sandinista government and the Contras who were fighting against them, uh, in an effort to try to uh, bring them into peace talks with one another. Uh, and in our team, we began talking about uh, conflictos in Spanish. Uh, and people were initially very confused. And then they said, oh, no, no, you mean desacuerdos. Desacuerdos is disagreements. So now what is the difference between a disagreement and a conflict in your culture? What do you do if there's a disagreement? And what do you do if there's a conflict? Who do you go to? What are some of the things that you do not do? Uh, how do you handle this? And now we can see what are all the words that you use? There may be a different form of conflict for each one of them and a different thing that you do with each one. And we can then ask what works in your culture? What's successful? And where do you get stuck? And wherever it is that you get stuck, wouldn't it make sense for us to talk to people from other cultures, which is part of one of the services that Bikram is providing here is bringing all of us from different cultures together to compare notes with one another. So we can see what it is that works in one place and what works in another. For some of you, the things that I'm talking about will make no sense at all and wouldn't be appropriate at all in your culture. And there is a tendency on the part of people in the United States to think that whatever it is that we do is the answer for everybody. Um, and that 
uh, is a kind of imposition. Uh, and it is also um, uh, 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 undermining uh, of uh, local success uh, stories and um, indigenous wisdom and a variety of other ways in which we need to appreciate that what it is that people actually do um, makes sense to them and it works at a certain level and then at a certain point it doesn't. Um, I did a mediation uh, relatively recently between a husband and wife who were having great difficulties with each other and they were both from uh, the Middle East, from very large families, uh, Syrian families that had come to the United States many years ago. And what became clear was the idea that we would bring one husband and one wife into communication with each other without bringing in their siblings, their aunts, their uncles, their parents, uh, their grandparents, um, even their, uh, their children into the conversation was just unimaginable to them. And so what we had to do was to design the mediation process in a way that allowed the entire extended family of both people, both the husband and the wife to come into the mediation and participate in it. And they were great. Um, and we had a massive, messy, all over the map conversation and they came out of it, figuring out what it is they were going to do and putting in place a support system that was going to actually work for them. Now let's get really deep and really serious about this. I'd like to give two more examples of significant forms of culture change because um, uh, we uh, particularly confront culture in organizations, in corporations, nonprofits, government institutions, et cetera. How do you deal with culture in an organizational setting? Uh, and I should tell you that uh, Vikram has sent out an article that I've written about transforming conflict cultures uh, through mediation uh, and also a set of PowerPoint slides you're welcome to all of those. They belong to you now, use them. Uh, if there's anything useful in them, by all means, use them. And in the article uh, that I wrote, I tell two stories about two uh, mediations I did that went in a completely different direction based on what was happening culturally. Here's the first. Uh, I was invited to mediate um, a dispute inside of children's hospital and I, uh, came in and I wanted to do interviews. And what I discovered in the interviews was that this was one of dozens and dozens of disputes inside the hospital where people were just fighting over um, uh, things that really didn't uh, uh, in the end seem to matter that much, but were incredibly important to them. But the place was filled with conflicts. And so what I decided to do was to bring everybody together rather than just tackle them one at a time. Uh, the place was um, uh, just completely paralyzed with conflict. So I brought everybody together, um, uh, about 150 people uh, who were the doctors, the nurses, the staff, the administrators in this hospital. And I said, look, uh, here's what I've discovered. Um, there's the, uh, you're just under an incredible amount of stress. This is a children's hospital. Children are dying every day. Children are being saved every day. Um, there are emotional responses that every one of you is having to that. And you're, there's no place for you to process them or talk about them. So um, we can't wave a magic wand and say, okay, it's all over. Uh, and it may, doesn't make sense to do this one by one. So instead, um, uh, we're not genies here, so I'm, I'm going to give you one wish. Uh, one thing that you can wish for that would uh, completely change the way that you handle this stress and all the conflicts that are arising. And so we start going around the room and we come to a man who is a nurse who said, look, uh, I just give every single thing that I have, every ounce of strength that I have every week. And I would appreciate it if at the end of a week, somebody would give me a flower as a way of saying thank you. And that just struck me as something really powerful. 
So I said, yeah, that is a wonderful idea. Would you start? Would you be the first one to give other people flowers? And he said, yes. So I said, raise your hand if you're willing to join him. Every hand went up. And in one week, the place was filled with flowers. Every Friday, everybody was giving everybody flowers. And now the next person said, or one of the next people said, um, why can't we create, we have a loudspeaker, a, a speaker system inside the hospital. Why can't we create a special tone for when a child dies so every one of us can stop just for a moment, just for a second or two and say goodbye to that child. Um, and then can we have another tone for when a child's life is saved? And then we can stop and say, yes, we saved a child's life. Um, just for a second or two. And there were 20, 30 things like that that happened. And in the space of one week, there wasn't hardly a conflict in the entire place. What happened to all those conflicts? The answer was the culture that they had created was one of intense amounts of stress. And here's the big deal about culture. We imagine it. And because we imagine it, we can imagine it differently. And now I'd like to mention a, uh, a quotation which is not in the materials um, from a Greek novelist uh, whose name is Nikos Kazantzakis, uh, who wrote this. The non-existent, uh, he says, uh, by imagining things, we bring them into existence. The non-existent is whatever we have not sufficiently imagined. Now, this is especially true with culture. And if we can chance, transform uh, a chronically conflicted organization like this children's hospital in the space of one week without doing a single mediation, except for the one that I did there, where we, everybody came together and we weren't mediating specific issues, we were mediating the culture. And the ideas that people came up with then fundamentally shifted everybody's attitudes towards their conflicts. Here's a second example. I was working with, um, uh, I was asked to come in and prevent a conflict in a cardboard box factory, very rough and tumble place made out of concrete blocks um, and the manager of the factory uh, is an elderly Latino man who was about to retire. Everybody in the factory was male and Latino, and they were about to bring in an Anglo woman to run the factory uh, from the outside. And so they knew this is just not going to work. People are, there are going to be conflicts all over the place. Work is going to stop. Um, they'll be resentful, there'll be all kinds of arguments and grievances and everything else. So I met with the woman beforehand and we developed a plan for how to do something different, how to communicate um, through cultural means what her intentions were and how she wanted that factory uh, to, uh, how the relation, she wanted those relationships in the factory to uh, um, change. Uh, and so on the week of the, the, the old factory was this Concord uh, concrete block building. And in order to get to the, uh, there were trucks that would come and deliver and have lunch uh, for the workers in the factory. Uh, but in order to get to the trucks, people had to walk through the dirt and sometimes through the mud um, to get out to the place where the trucks were. Uh, and it was just really ugly, unpainted, everything else. So on the weekend before she came in, she and her husband and her two sons came out and they laid a concrete walkway from the factory out to the sidewalk. They painted the factory inside and out. They put in a little flower garden next to the front door. She made lace curtains for the windows in the factory and it would be very difficult to, estimate, or to overestimate um, the power of lace curtains. 
she uh, put rugs on the floor, brought in a table and chairs for people to sit at, coffee cups and a coffee maker for them to have make their own coffee, um, a uh, music, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, a CD player uh, and lots of CDs so people could pick their own music. Um, and uh, paintings on the walls. Uh, and all of this, in, you know, again, these guys walked in on Monday morning, they didn't know what hit them. It was incredible. The whole situation now completely reversed. They were so impressed with the respect that she had given them by listening to them and hearing and knowing what it was that they wanted and responding and fixing it like that immediately before she even began. Um, and every conflict that was imagined simply dissipated. Now they had new conflicts uh, because everybody was now thinking of her as their mother and that created other problems for her. But the original problems had disappeared. Now what went on here? What happened was um, the signs and symbols that I mentioned before, the semiotics of the factory, um, were fundamentally shifted in the direction of a message which said, you matter, you matter to me enough for me to put my own money into this. I'm not being paid by the company to do this. Uh, and my whole family is coming out and we are going to do something that shows you how much we care about you and how much we respect you. Um, and that was pretty impressive. Um, now, how many opportunities are there to do something like that? And the answer, of course, is that they're countless. Um, now, there's another piece of this, which is, uh, here's a nice quotation from management consultant and writer Peter Drucker, uh, quoted in the article uh, and in the materials. He says, uh, a nice quote, he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And he's referring, of course, to organizational situations in which everybody is very concerned about strategy, but they're not at all concerned about the culture. But a really brilliant research project was um, created several years ago um, and written up in the Harvard Business Review. And the research project was this. Uh, three people went out and they went to corporations, nonprofits, government agencies that had gone through some form of organizational change that had failed. And they asked the question, why did this change effort fail? And the single answer that came back was the failure to change the culture. And then what they did was they broke the culture down into a series of different pieces, four basic pieces. And I won't go through those that materials that, that's in your materials, but one of those pieces is how conflicts are handled, how communicate, how people negotiate with each other. And so that is why I say that every resolution is necessarily an act of culture, because what we are really trying to do uh, is to transform, that is to change the form of the process that people are using to resolve their disputes by reorienting it to a different meaning. Uh, and so what becomes possible in the mediation process uh, is to interrupt um, the activity of culture by asking a set of questions uh, that uh, uh, ask it to look at itself. So for example, uh, and this can happen in any mediation. Um, what do you, uh, one person said, let's say we have, uh, let's just take a simple case involving a husband and wife. Uh, she says something and he shakes his head. Okay, so you turn to him and you say, what do you think she meant by what she just said? And he says, I think she meant that she doesn't like me or appreciate me or whatever it may happen to be. And I said, uh, would you like to find, and I would then say, would you like to find out if that's what she actually meant? 
He's trapped. He has nowhere to go. He has to say yes. So why don't you ask her right now? And now he turns to her and says, what, do you, what did you mean by that? And she says, that isn't what I meant at all. Here's what I meant. But notice what we have done is we have shifted the, his culture and her culture, neither of which acknowledged the or understood the other one's culture in the direction of dialogue and therefore understanding of what the other person is actually saying, what they actually mean as a result of what they're saying. Here's another one, very simple one. Um, everyone here has been in meetings that were completely pointless. And we have sat there in the course of these meetings, not knowing exactly why we were there. The meeting is terrible. Nothing is taking place. It's really a horrible experience. And we sit there and say nothing. Here's something you can say the next time that happens. Raise your hand and say, excuse me, is this meeting working for everyone? Because it's not working for me. Could we go around the table right now and ask each person to say one thing that they think would make this meeting work better for them? Uh, you just blew up the cultural idea of the meeting the assumptions, the unspoken um, symbols uh, and signs that were being communicated in the course of that meeting. And you transformed it, I will even say, uh, into a democratic form. Uh, and a part of what conflict resolution is about is the creation of democratic forms, that is participatory forms, forms that let people say for themselves what things mean to them. Um, just think for yourself, how many of my arguments that I have had with my spouse, my children, my family have been about the, what things mean to me or them? And I can tell you, it is the overwhelming majority of all the arguments that you have had without any question. What do you do in the presence of those arguments? Um, you stop and you turn and look at them. And simply by looking at them and asking, what does this mean? You have already taken the first step in the direction of cultural intelligence. Then what we have to do is we have to take a second step. The second step is to acknowledge that there is no single correct meaning. What it means to you is simply what it means to you. That is at the level of emotion. We don't tell people that they have the wrong emotion. They have whatever emotion they have. That's, it's not the wrong emotion. Um, now what we wanna do is try to help them have an emotionally intelligent conversation. <clears throat> That's something different. And the same is true with regard to culture, with regard to meaning. Meaning, mediation as a process begins with the idea that there is more than one truth. And what we are looking for are ways for those two truths, my truth and your truth, to speak to each other, to learn from each other, to actually combine together and create a third higher order of truth, to synthesize, in other words, uh, and become something greater than what it was before. Uh, that's fundamentally, as I see it, what mediation is about. How do we do this? Well, sometimes uh, it's going to be simple and sometimes it's going to be tough. What do you do when it's tough? Here is one approach that um, I use when people are having arguments and they're really totally into them. Uh, and I, they're having their argument and sometimes I'll let it go because I wanna see what it is that they're doing and uh, what each of them is doing that is contributing to the argument. And then I will ask a relatively simple question, excuse me, I'll try to interrupt, sometimes they won't let me. And then I'll try again, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And they will say yes at some point. And I will say, 
um, the same question for the meeting. Is this conversation working? Everybody knows it isn't working. They will say no. Question two, would you like it to work? Everybody wants it to work. Why would you like it to work? Don't tell me, tell him, tell her. And now let's ask a couple of other questions. What is one thing the other person could do right now that would make this conversation work better for you? And are you willing to do that? Great, let's start over again and try that and see if that works. And you do that for both people. And then here's another step. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being highest, how would you rank the conversation that we were having just before I interrupted you? They'll say a two, a zero, minus four, whatever it may happen to be. Um, and what, how would you rank the conversation we're having right now? Seven, six, eight, whatever it is. And final question, what would it take to make it a 10? And now we can see that something fundamentally has shifted. Now, this would be in a, a technique that I would use in uh, mediations in the US. I might not use it in a mediation in, involving people from different cultures. And I have done mediations in over 20 different countries in multiple hundreds, maybe even thousands of different cultures. It depends on how you, how you define what a culture is. Um, but notice the power of the um, uh, process of looking at culture, discovering what, is it, what it is that isn't working and negotiating expectations uh, and relationships going forward. Isn't this exactly what mediation is? This is what we do. So uh, a final piece, and then what I'd like to do is to uh, invite people to jump in uh, and to say whatever it is that they, uh, their experience has been um, and, and how they handle uh, issues in their particular cultures. Um, the question is, well, let me say it a little differently. Uh, every, um, every culture has a culture of conflict and every couple, Every family, every organization creates a culture of conflict. Where does this culture come from? First, from the families of origin of the people who are in the conflict. Um, in, if you are married, it's what your mother and father did when they had conflicts and what your spouse's mother and father did when they had conflicts. Um, and it's also what has happened to you in conflict over the course of your life, what you have learned uh, as a result of the conflicts that you have created uh, or experienced from others. So the question then becomes, how do we strengthen our conflict cultures? Whatever our culture is, we want to see what we can do to strengthen it. And there are two fundamental ways of strengthening any conflict culture. One, by building skills in being able to handle difficult behaviors. Diff uh, uh, behaviors that otherwise get you into impasse, places where nobody can move, places where people are stuck. And the second is by discouraging um, activities that perpetuate conflict. For example, um, bias and prejudice. Uh, 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 if I can describe it as stereotypes, uh, and as well as biases and prejudices uh, and slurs and all kinds of statements of this sort, uh, discriminations against one another, uh, treating others as less than ourselves. Um, a second is uh, what I think of as conditioned passivity and reactiveness. Um, 
the messages from our culture that tell us to just sit back and, and accept it and not do anything. Why do our cultures teach us this? Because culture is a system and the goal of the system is to turn in a circle and replicate itself. So we want to, what we want to do is to stop that replication process in order to be able to design uh, cultures that are more successful for all of us. That means stepping up to the responsibility for saying what works for us and accepting responsibility for listening to whatever it is that works for others. Uh, there are others as well. There's uh, a discouraging, shaming and blaming, uh, cynicism and apathy, stories of victimization and demonization. Uh, that is way, finding ways of transforming conflict stories or what I call, I wrote a book called uh, The Dance of Opposites and one of the chapters is uh, the narrative structure of conflict stories. Uh, and it's about the ability to try to transform the conflict culture from they did it to me to here is what we are going to do differently going forward so that we are neither of us feeling uh, done to. So uh, the purpose of this is to say that culture is a powerful instrument in conflict resolution and it is one that is in your hands uh, as a mediator. It is susceptible to mediation. And through that mediation process, it is possible for us to both strengthen skills and discourage behaviors that uh, prevent us from being able uh, to look at how cult uh, helps us not only get into conflict, but get out of it as well. So uh, there's a lot more um, and there's lots and lots that you can read on the subject, uh, including the short piece that I wrote, but there are other uh, things uh, that have been written as well. Uh, so let me, uh, uh, Vikram, do we have time for a few questions? We have as much time as you will have. <laughs> we have as much time, but only before that, I just want to take you through the people here. We've got people from all over the world. I also want to boast this aspect that I've got people from all over the world here. So let me just take you through. Abe is in Australia. And he, Abe, you can just say hi otherwise. So then we have Alexander. He's in Kazakhstan. I mean, if anyone wants to just unmute and say hi in your own language, you are allowed. You're not allowed to say hi, hello, or anything like that. Andre, Andrea is in Ireland. Then we Any have... <laughs> Atman is in Morocco. Diana is in Argentina. And then Hola. Dimitri, Dimitri is in Russia. Elena is in Russia. I'm going alphabetically. Elizabeth also, I assume, is in Hello. Russia. And we have Funmi, she's in Nigeria. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Then we have whom we have after that. Then we have Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni is in Nam Italy. Tran. Nam Tran from Vietnam. Xin yeah. chào. Alphabetically, we get there. there. Giovanni, mm -hmm. you want to say hi to Chao? Okay, the Chao is done. Then Gunasilian is in India. Isaac is in Ghana. Ghana, you want to say something? Hello? No, hello is not allowed. Any other language is allowed. <laughs> okay. So then Kathleen is in the US. I don't know what language she can use other than <laughs> saying hi. Morning from West Texas. Kato is in Japan. As well from Iran. Yeah, he's coming there. We're all alphabetically coming there. Then we have Kath Kato is in Japan. Kato. Kato is something more than that. A wave is not enough. More than that. Right. Yes, that's much better. Lisa is in the US. Hey, y'all. Oh, yeah, something better. <laughs> uh, and I think perhaps Tagalog. Mm -hmm. okay, From Marissa. 
I'm getting everyone in. I'm getting everyone in. The only thing is that as they raise their hands, their name goes up the list, so I don't get to see that. Marissa is in Philippines. Yeah, mabuhay, magandang hapon. Then Mary, Mary is in Argentina. Mary, you want to say hi in hi in Spanish? You want to say hi in Spanish? Okay, we'll get you in. Nam is in Vietnam. He just. Root constant. Root constant is. Root, you want to write your. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Oh, okay. Sarah is in Kenya. Ah, uh, Shikamo Ken Habari. Then we have Shifan is in India, and she's in Kashmir, so she can tell us to say something in Kashmiri. Sherry is in the US. Hello. And anything more than hello, Sherry? That the hellos have happened. I'm thinking more. Okay, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. Stefan is in Burundi. Stefan, how many languages do you speak? You'll have to unmute yourself. Amahoro, everybody. That's in Swahili. I speak six languages. Okay. So you want to go through all the six? I don't know if Ken has that much time. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tony is in Vietnam. Tony. And Jimena. Okay, yeah, Tony. And Jimena is in Chile. Hola, Ken. Muy buenas tardes. Saludos desde Chile. And Jan. Jan is in Vietnam. And Prabhat is in the in India. Your name is went up because of the you raised your hand, so I couldn't get in the alphabetical. Pra, 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 oh, okay. Namaste. Yeah, that's much better. Reza, Reza is in Iran. You've met him. So okay. So the basic greetings done. Now Prabhat's question. Before before Prabhat before that Prabhat. Elena had a question. Ken on of course <laughs> culture in mediation. So we can take that because you also touched on these aspects. So I'll take that first because her question came in first on WhatsApp to me. Elena, you want to ask the question or you want me to do it? Uh, I, I think Prabhat was had his hand up first. No, no, Elena had the question first. I got the question on WhatsApp first. So her question goes in first. I'll ask you the question is, is it possible that as mediators, we can also be influenced by various layers of cultural associations and how do we neutralize impact of these unconscious bias before we commence mediation. Ah, That's very nice. Okay, so um, the difficulty is that the answer is yes, we all come with um, countless biases. Um, uh, uh, academically, if you take a look at cultural biases um, uh, or what they're sometimes referred to as cognitive biases, uh, over a hundred have been identified um, through experiments. Uh, and the important part is not to actually neutralize those biases because on some level, it isn't really possible to do that. Instead, to become aware of our biases uh, and open to alternative experiences, alternative forms of knowledge, alternative information. So um, a bias is simply a preference. Uh, it's what we prefer. And then, of course, a series of responses to those preferences arise. The most dominant one is what is called confirmation bias, which is uh, if we prefer, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, conversations that take place between two people, as opposed to multiple people, uh, we will constantly try to get ourselves into situations where we are only speaking one-on-one -on -one with another person. Uh, or if we believe that um, uh, the society in which we live is perfect, uh, we will find examples of its perfection. Uh, or if we believe that it's imperfect, we will find examples of its imperfection. 
And all of those are designed to confirm the bias. So the problem is that bi those biases are so deep and so subtle uh, and so influential that we can't actually uh, eliminate them. And by pretending to be neutral, what we essentially do is to um, push them down beneath the level of open conversation and then act on them anyway. So as a man, uh, I will have had certain experiences in my life uh, that will lead me to make assumptions about women and about men, uh, just as women will have and other men will have, and they will all have different assumptions. Um, but instead of pretending that I am not a man uh, or that I'm not from the United States or that I'm not a mediator, instead what I want to do is to admit to those things, to recognize them as lenses that influence what I see uh, and then to search for alternative lenses. That is to be more open to what women have to say because I don't have those same experiences. Uh, and the same goes for any set of cultural uh, biases that I may have. So uh, Bernie Mayer has written a book which is called uh, Beyond Neutrality. And the basic idea is instead of describing mediation as neutral, um, we ought to describe it instead as something different. And I've come up with a word, I wrote a book called Mediating Dangerously. And the phrase that I use is omnipartiality, by which I mean being on everybody's side at the same time. And that's not just a phrase, I actually mean that. When I mediate, I am literally on everybody's side. I take their side. I try to understand what happened from their perspective. And then I try to find a bridge inside myself between those two sets of realities. So the answer is yes, we need to be aware of those biases um, and uh, open to alternative experiences and open to learning from those alternative experiences because that's basically what they represent represents is uh, I'm done learning. I'm not open to learning anything new. And that's why it is so difficult and so dangerous for us in mediation. Um, so there are a series of ways that we can do this. I'll give you one very simple one that I use. Uh, when I begin to form judgments about another person, I ask myself this question what would have had to have happened to you to make you act like that? And that isn't an answer for them. It's a platform for a question that is genuinely curious to find out what this really meant to them, um, how it felt to them. And those kinds of questions are exactly the ones we want to ask in mediation. I hope that helps. But Elena, Dimitri will help you on the translation if you need to, although you are now very comfortable with English, but still, if there's something, Dimitri is there. Dimitri, you can help you. Okay, Elena. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, Kel. Thank you very much. It's very interesting, uh, and I have learned it a lot to today. Learned a lot today. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I've, I've been telling Elena that, look, you know the language, you just have to speak it. That's it. And she speaks very well. She not... thinks that she needs a translator, but she doesn't need one. But what I did again was I actually missed out on Jonathan. Jonathan is there. He has not said hi to you. Jonathan, you want to say hi to again? Okay, so he's there. Yeah. Ken, Ken, thank you. Uh, greetings from the old country. And thank you for a very interesting is it the uh, is it, is yeah. it the old old country or is it the invisible yeah, country? So, invisible country. We might as well see you. Which country is this where you're invisible? Uh, what I'm seeing is Jonathan Lux, UK. Yeah, but we have to see you also. Okay. <laughs> yep. And yes, much better. He's a very senior mediator in the, in the UK. 
and of course he's been on evolution of a mediator also and i missed out katerzina also katerzina you didn't say hi to ken you were hi you were i think you were up on the list somewhere yeah dzień dobry ken wszystkiego dobrego z polski okay so now prabhat finally your turn to ask the question <laughs> Oh, thank you. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Cat is in your term will come next. You're you're okay. on on the waiting list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I think it's uh, my question is uh, a, a little similar to Elena, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, um, uh, it, it's different. Uh, so, uh, in majority of the negotiations, especially those which are relating to commercial disputes, um, we. Uh, address uh, it's not the subject or the issue of dispute that is more difficult to uh, negotiate with uh, what is more difficult to address during mediation or negotiate in mediation is the unequal power positions of the two parties uh, um, and very often it is uh, 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 the power of uh, one where the person feels i'm very conscious about that pie because if i give that extra pie i'm setting a new stand every pie that i give out sets a new rate tariff and the standards and the benchmarks so they're in a powerful position uh, and the other one uh, uh, where they feel that every little pie matters to them so that one pie should they have a greater right on that extra pie so they are deprived they, they feel deprived uh, uh, um, and they come from that sort of culture uh, 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 to put it in your words uh, so there is one culture where is there is a sense of deprivation and the other culture where there is a position of power to grant or not to grant so to say Now, negotiating that, that unequal balance where typically the one who's powerful tends to feel that things should be worked out uh, according to their viewpoint more because they are commercially more relevant. It's always the most difficult thing to negotiate with. Now, with your experience, can I just wanted, are there some tricks around how to negotiate? how to negotiate and deal with those situations. Yes, uh, thank you. First of all, what you have identified, Prabhat, is, is very real. Uh, and I think very common for all of us. We, we have all had experiences with power differentials. And a part of what mediation consists of is an effort to uh, what, do what we call balancing power. But the difficulty is uh, nobody really explains very clearly exactly what that means. But here's an example. Uh, while you are negotiating, let's say money, you are also negotiating the relationships between the people who have the money and those who do not. And whereas one may have more power over the money, the other may have power over the relationship. And if the goal of this negotiation is not just to transfer a sum of money from one person to the other, but to build a more successful and enduring relationship, then the chances are much better of doing what you described. Um, the, uh, the difficulties come in commercial cases where uh, there is no ongoing relationship. But where there is an ongoing relationship, a part of what you can ask is um, very simply, uh, what are your goals for your relationship with each other? And now everybody is equally entitled to say what their goals are. And there is a technique for doing this that is called the Blake and Mouton method uh, after two uh, professors at the University of Texas. And what it consists of is sending Uh, let's say, for example, labor unions and management. So you send the labor union into one room and managers into the other room. And each one of them separately comes up with the goals for their relationship and presents them to the other side. But guess what? Everybody wants a relationship that is respectful. 
that is successful, uh, that's effective, uh, that's uh, communicative, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so they discover that they actually have a lot in common. And now we accumulate those points of consensus. Uh, and then secondly, we send them back into those rooms again, separate rooms, to identify what are the barriers that stand in the way of their achieving their goals? What blocks them? What's preventing them? And nobody's, don't put anybody's name down. We want activities, behaviors that either side engages in that block those goals. And now we've identified where we wanna go and what's preventing us from getting there. What's left is how do we overcome those barriers in order to achieve our goals? And for that, we put people together in joint groups to brainstorm suggestions for how to get there. And as soon as you give them that task, that is something that is very successful. Here's a second uh, where everybody has some input. How did we get into this mess? Uh, I've developed a technique which I call conflict mapping. And it's similar to a process that is known as process mapping that's used in some organizations. And what we do is we just take flip chart paper and put it on a wall and give people marking pens and say, okay, write down what happened first, what happened second, what happened third, what happened fourth. This map, how we got into this mess that we're in now. And now, immediately before the first thing happened, did anything else happen? And if so, what was it? And what could have happened between step one and step two that could have moved it in a different direction so step two wouldn't take place? So we'll go back to the example I said before, um, when she, she said hello to me in the wrong way this morning. Um, and therefore I assumed that she didn't like me and so I treated her badly uh, or insulted her. So now we can say, okay, um, what, ha what happened before somebody said hello? Um, is, some, is the person sick? Uh, what other alternative interpretations are there for what took place? That's one way of doing it. Uh, another way is to um, go back into the culture issue again. And for example, in a commercial case, ask the question, what does the money mean to you? Why are you doing this? What's at stake for you in this conversation? And why is that important to you? Why does it matter? And on those kinds of questions, um, power doesn't uh, account for anything anymore because everybody has an equal power to say what matters to them. I think of it this way. Um, uh, there are three sets of questions I can ask everybody in this call. Question one, who's the oldest and who's the youngest? Single correct answer for everyone. Question two, how old are you? Single correct answer for each person. Question three, what issues are you facing at whatever age you're at? And now there are multiple correct answers for everybody. Those are our questions. Those are mediative questions. And unfortunately I have to leave at 10 so I think there's just room for maybe two. one more call. Two, two. There are two people. Can we have to take them both of them? In. Okay. Two. So we'll Reza, try. Reza, Reza, please. But we'll give you three minutes, Reza. We have six minutes. Okay, maybe we'll give you two and a okay. half minutes. Then we have one okay. minute to just conclude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Sir Clock. Thank you for your marvelous presentation. Hello. It's an honor to be here and learn from you again. I've written down my question and uh, I read it to you. As far as I understood, the cultures are resources of systematic results of behaviors which directly influence society. And to minimize these speech globally, the answer is to learn cultures elaborately. The first question is, how actually is this state of structure feasible globally? And the second one, if some elements in different cultures are polar opposites, how can we bring those people from different cultures to a settlement? how mediators prioritize their mediation principles approaching this situation? Thank you. Beautiful question, is a very, very nice question. Um, let me take the second one first. Um, if we imagine the earth as having a magnetic field with a North Pole and a South Pole, 
uh, and they are poles apart. Uh, the question is what connects the poles? And the answer is there are two things. One, the line of magnetism that runs right through the center of the earth that connects north and south, which in conflict is a line of caring about whatever the issue is. And the second is the equator, which is where they cancel out. Now the equator is like compromise, but the poles can be combined together. In fact, uh, out of their opposition, out of their polarity can come uh, some incredibly great insights into um, uh, what the problem is. As long as you approach the problem as though there isn't a single correct answer that you have to choose between. And that's the difficulty. Each pole believes that it is correct, knows that it is correct, and actually is correct for itself, but is wrong in the sense that it has excluded the possibility of the other pole. And there is no north without a south and no south without a north. So the poles actually bring themselves into existence around the same issue. There's just like uh, the, brand, the, the leaves on a tree trying to describe the roots and the roots trying to describe the leaves. They are united, they are one. And that's the key insight that mediation allows us to bring through dialogue between North and South. They discover what they have in common. Uh, so I would say that's the principal answer. And now I want to go to the, the next question. Um, I, your question is very rich and there's a lot more to be said. Yes, and it. yeah, that actually required a longer answer, but I don't know, we've got you a little rushed, so it's okay. We'll take that up later. But uh, before that, just Yonka, who was from Turkey, she wanted to say hi to you. She was leaving, so okay, she's left. Doesn't matter. Yeah, get Zina, please. So it's the last question. Uh, Ken, I would like to ask you. I, I I'm really delighted by by you know being here and listening to you. And uh, my question is, uh, do you have any special model or skill? to help you, to help us mediators to calm down and to heal ourselves and not to get to the inner conflicts as we work every day with the people with conflicts, stress, anxiety, you know, what's, what, what's is connected with the conflict. Beautiful question, Kevin. Uh, the, uh... Of course, many of us are in this field because we are so deeply impacted by conflict. And uh, mediation, every mediation that I do externally teaches me a little bit of, uh, to be a little bit of a better person internally. It uh, uh, is a, a kind of rewiring uh, of our emotional systems, because if we can do this for others, why can't we do it for ourselves? And um, here is kind of what I have discovered over a period of time. Um, uh, the, um, let's see, how do I say this? Um, uh, probably the best way of saying it is to say that uh, there is a, uh, it's a matter of superficiality and depth. The deeper you go, the more connected you are. And so part of what we are doing in conflict resolution is letting go of a kind of superficial presence. Let me describe it very quickly. Um, you get angry about something. What's beneath your anger? Um, possibly a fear that you will lose something so that the fear can be deeper than the anger. And what's deeper than the fear? The possibility of grief and loss and pain. And what's deeper than that? Caring. So the truth is that the actual healing work of mediation is not done in your head, it's done in your heart. And 
the fundamental healing that takes place is the one of realizing that you are every one of those people that you are impacted by, that you are working with, they're all inside of you. And so every mediation that you do is a, way, is a form of healing. Um, it's a kind of meditation. Uh, it's a return to oneness. And if you can do that consistently uh, over a lifetime, um, hopefully bit by bit, piece by piece, um, you will begin to heal those places where uh, you're broken. Um, that is what's happened to me. But Ken, you would need to give two more minutes. Two more minutes, please. There's one very nice question that's come on from Stefan. He says, is the solution to a lot of cultural adversarial conflicts not lying, not laying in to be aware, but to step out of cultural and adversarial thinking? Is that... Ah, yes. Um, well, I, the question is, uh, how do we step out of it, out of the adversarial thinking? And I think that the answer is that we have to step into an alternative way of thinking, which is the welcoming of conflict uh, as a source of information about whatever it is that isn't working in our lives. Uh, conflict is simply the sound made by the cracks in a system. Um, it is an invitation into a higher order of skill. So uh, nobody on this call gets into conflicts with kids on the playground over who gets to play with the toys. Why? Because we've outgrown that kind of conflict. How did we outgrow it? By developing skills to be able to talk to one another in order to resolve it. At which point, when we develop those skills, we evolve to a higher order of conflict. So every one of us is evolving throughout our lives in our ability to handle conflicts um, and learning higher order skills and then receiving higher order conflicts as a result. And that process, so far as I know, never ends. So um, uh, again, I'm afraid I do have yeah. to leave. Okay, so basically, Ken, so now we have, we have more than 75 speakers from more than 35 countries. The Zoom link remains the same. The schedule is on mediatorvikram.com. So please drop in whenever you have time. For whatever time you can, there'll be a lot of questions that you can answer there. So that can happen. And Thank you, one, one a, a Yonka from Turkey just wants to say bye because she was in and out because of a connection. So Yonka, you yes. can say bye. Well, yep, yes, yes. Merhaba, me, merhaba. Hi from, hi everyone. And I, I think Ken, uh, his speech was so inspiring for me. And I thank you uh, for your kind invitation. Hope to see you, uh, my speech. Bye. Okay so, okay, so all of you can unmute yourself and say bye to Ken in one, at one go. Whatever language it comes out in, bye. it should just sound okay, like bye. 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 Thank you, Ken. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Bye. So now Ken Bye. is left. So I think we now I am still available for whatever conversation as long as. Bye. You Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Vikram. Bye. 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 Okay. So.